this amendment vote is not about democracy and the rule of law in Libya. We all long to see democracy and the rule of law in Libya. This vote is about democracy and the rule of law in the United the States. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Uh, this amendment uh, is not germane to the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. Uh, this amendment is better addressed within the National Defense Authorization Act or the Defense Appropriation Bill. I yield back the balance of my time. Madam for Chairman. what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Madam Chairman, I uh, move to strike the last words. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. And I, I want to join Chairman Adderholt in uh, urging rejection of this uh, non germane amendment. Uh, members, of course, uh, uh, would, would not uh, want to uh, vote against uh, contravening the law in, any, in anything that we do, but we have to. Uh, acknowledge that this amendment is not uh, germane to this bill and uh, the rhetoric that has uh, attended the introduction of this amendment uh, contains just to put it mildly insinuations and charges uh, that um, this member finds uh, unacceptable this is not the place however uh, madam chairman to engage in a full debate of our, of our Libyan operations or our, our foreign policy uh, in general so I'll uh, I restrict myself to simply saying that I, I do think this uh, well, the gentleman amendment yield. is inappropriate for this bill. I'll be happy to yield. I uh, support the gentleman. gentleman's position and rise in opposition to the Sherman Amendment. I thank the gentleman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The, pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from California will be postponed. For, for what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Madam Chairman, I, Madam Chairman, I have an amendment at the table. The, Will report the amendment. Will the gentleman specify? Would the gentleman please state the title of the amendment? Uh, Davis Bacon. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Gosar of Arizona. At the end of the bill before the short title, insert the following. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to comply with subchapter 4 of chapter 31 of title 40, United States Code, popularly known as the Davis-Bacon Act. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of my amendment that would exempt all construction projects authorized under this act from the inflationary and unwise Davis-Bacon Act. As members of Congress, we are stewards of the public treasury. We have an obligation to spend taxpayer money wisely. The government does not earn money. The government does not generate wealth. The government takes money from those who work hard for a living. In order to justify that act, we have an obligation, at a minimum, spend this money wisely. The Davis-Bacon Act adds unnecessary costs. Research shows that the Davis-Bacon Act imposes costs that average 22 percent above market wages. This is unacceptable. Every dollar wasted is a dollar we can't use on other projects. In most cities, the Davis-Bacon Act imposes wages that bear no resemblance to prevailing market wages. In some cities, the rates are more than double the market wages. I ask for everyone's support in stopping this wasteful spending of taxpayer money, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from North Carolina rise? Madam Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment and uh, move to strike the last words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment, which uh, will preclude the Department of Homeland Security or any entity that uh, receives funding from the Department of Homeland Security, such as state and local governments, from insisting on fair labor standards for construction contracts, also known as the Davis-Bacon Act standards. Davis-Bacon is a pretty simple concept uh, and a fair one. 
It requires that workers on federally funded construction projects be paid no less than the wages paid in the community for similar work. According to the Economic Policy Institute, the differences uh, in labor costs uh, that this makes are, are insignificant. Average labor costs, including benefits and payroll taxes, are roughly one quarter of construction costs. Thus, if there's an increase in overall contract costs due to higher wages, it likely would be modest, to the point, in many cases, of being virtually undetectable. And, in fact, Davis-Bacon in assuring that fair wages attract skilled workers, uh, they, this might actually mean that the work is uh, completed at a higher quality and in less time. Uh, this amendment uh, flouts the basic concept of, uh, of wage fairness. At the exact time we're trying to get people back to work across the country, is this House going to uh, vote to drive down the wages of workers who do business uh, with the government on the theory that it might cost uh, a little less money on construction projects? And are we going to strong arm the states and say they can't uphold the labor standards they've adopted in their own right? I strongly recommend a no vote. The House has spoken repeatedly on this issue this year. We've taken two votes on this. During H.R. 1, and during the FAA reauthorization, and both times amendments to strike Davis-Bacon standards failed. We don't need to revisit this again here tonight. Now you'll back. I, I will yield to the I, chairman. I rise in strong support of the gentleman's position and against this amendment. By the way, Davis and Bacon were two Republicans, so uh, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> <laughs> I thank the ranking member, and I yield back. Madam Chair. For what per the gentleman yields back. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Uh, Madam Chair, I move to strike the last word. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, rise in support of the GOSAR amendment. Uh, the, the amendment that uh, eliminates a requirement for Davis Bacon within the funds of this appropriation bill. And I don't know another member of Congress that has lived under Davis Bacon. I have. I've lived underneath it for more than 30 years. I've received Davis-Bacon wages when I was working for other contractors, and I paid a lot of Davis-Bacon wages as an owner-operator of a construction company that I operated for over 28 years. I can tell you that the federal government interfering with a contractual relationship between an employer and an employee is the wrong thing to do. It does drive up the cost. The gentleman's opening remarks were spot on. My own construction records show that the costs go up between 8 and 35 percent, hardly insignificant. And it scrambles the relationship between employers and employees who are always jockeying for the highest paid federally designated scale. I've seen wages change from double from just going across the road because the federal government has designated a different wage scale for one division rather than another. We know this is union scale. Nobody said that. This is government imposed union scale. And, I, and, it, and I'm not going to stand here to protect and defend those Republicans. They did it to protect the unions in New York. And we know that because the labor from Alabama was going to New York in 1931 to construct a federal building, and they wanted to lock the black construction workers that were coming from Alabama out of the trade unions in New York. That was the motive. And now today the motive is to protect union scale. If we want to build four miles of road or five, we go without Davis-Bacon and we build five. If we stay with Davis-Bacon, we'll build four. If we want to build five schools, we can do so with Merit Shop. If we only want to build four, we stick with Davis-Bacon. If, if you want to do as many Democrats have said on this floor, and that is that any relationship between two consenting adults the federal government shouldn't be involved in, well, this is a relationship the federal government should not be involved in. For the federal government to tell me that I can't say to my own son, I'd like to climb in the seat of your excavator and sit there for $10 an hour, federal government says I can't. He's got to pay me some $28 rate or whatever that is. But the government has no business interfering and no business driving up these costs, and we must go through this period of austerity. That requires that we not impose federal union scale on federal construction projects. This amendment that blocks that, the, the requirement for that funding. It saves the taxpayers money. And by the way, we've done a lot of quality work over the decades that I've been in the business, and I would match the work of our Merit Shop employees up against any union workers out there who do good work too. 
and I work with them, and, I, and I've worked alongside them on, on, on projects, but the quality of merit shop work cannot be challenged. We do it according to the specification, according to the plans, according to the architecture, and according to the engineer. And if we didn't meet those specifications, they would reject the work and we'd pay the penalty. My company doesn't pay penalties. We do quality work, and so do the people I associate and bid with. So I get a little worn down on that quality of workmanship. I'm real proud of the merit shop work in the United States, and I think the free market should set the wages. Labor is a commodity, just like corn or beans or oil or gold, and the value of it needs to be determined, be determined by the, the competition, supply, and demand in the workplace. I urge the adoption of the GOSAR Amendment, and I'll certainly support it, and I'll be happy to carry this on all throughout this appropriation process, and I yield back the balance of my time. I, I would yield. I, I'd be happy to yield if Thank time you. allows. So I just would want to know if I could get the address of, uh, you didn't mention that, of where it's, where, where it's located, your company. It's in Kyron, Iowa. Okay. It's been there since 1975. Thank you. And we're a second generation company. Thanks. I yield back. The gentleman from Iowa yields back. Does anyone else seek recognition? The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Arizona will be postponed. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will read. Amendment offered by Mr. Altmaier of Pennsylvania. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following new section. Use of American iron, steel, and manufactured goods. Section. None of the funds appropriated or otherwise made available by this act may be used for the construction, modification, maintenance, or repair of vehicle or pedestrian fencing along the southern border unless all of the iron, steel, and manufactured goods used in the construction, modification, maintenance, or repair are produced in the United States. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? The gentleman's amendment. Uh, the point of order is reserved. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair, and I rise in support of American Steel in maintaining security along our southern border. This amendment is actually very simple. I'm offering it because it requires that any repairs, modifications, maintenance, or construction of new portions of the fence along our southern border be made with American Steel, American Iron, and American manufactured steel goods. Now, as I'm sure my colleagues are aware, the Buy American Act, which was enacted in 1933, already requires the government to purchase domestic goods for direct federal procurement. And for some particularly important areas critical to our national security, such as nearly all defense projects and spending, the requirements for our government to buy American goods are even stronger. I believe that the steel used in the fence along our southern border should be included in that category, and that is simply what this amendment does. I can't imagine that there would be opposition in this chamber to the use of American-made steel in the construction of our border fence along our southern border. Many of my colleagues, I'm sure, remember in 2007 when it came to our attention that we were, in some cases, using Chinese-made steel in construction of the Mexican border fence. We were all equally outraged by that. We were able to encourage, and finally, through hard work and, and bipartisanship, encourage uh, successfully the Department of Homeland Security to use American-made steel. This amendment gives that the force of law, as I said, under the Buy American Act, which already applies to many American-made goods in the defense industry. So that's the purpose of this amendment, and I would yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Alabama rise? Uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, make a point of order, so insist on my point of order. The gentleman will state your point of order. Uh, I make a point of order against the amendment because it proposes to change existing law and constitutes legislation and an appropriation bill, and therefore violates Clause 2 of Rule 21. The rule states in pertinent part 
an amendment to a general appropriation bill shall not be in order if change in existing law requires a new determination. I would ask for a ruling from the chair. Does any member wish to be heard on the point of order? The chair is ready to make its uh, ruling. The chair finds that this amendment includes language requiring a new determination of where certain items are produced. The amendment therefore constitutes legislation in violation of Clause 2 of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. The purpose is the gentleman from Louisiana right. To present an amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment. I want to reserve a point of order on this amendment. Point of order is reserved. The clerk will uh, report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Scalise of Louisiana. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Mm -hmm. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to implement or enforce Executive Order 13502. The FAR Council supporting regulations FAR Rule 2009-005 or any agency memorandum, bulletin, or contracting policy that derives its authority from Executive Order 13502 or FAR Rule 2009-005. Gentleman from Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I bring the amendment uh, because what we're trying to do is prevent the. Uh, the department from implementing or using taxpayer money to implement executive order number 13502 and in the effect of that executive order has been to mandate project labor agreements on projects that are worth 25 million dollars or more. Uh, what we're talking about here uh, is a requirement that is increasing the cost dramatically of projects similar to the debate we had a little earlier uh, if you look at, uh, there have been a number of studies done. There was a 2009 Beacon Hill study uh, that looked at uh, the impact uh, if this type of policy was in effect in 2008, uh, which fortunately it wasn't, but if this executive order was being implemented in 2008, all of the projects that were done that had a value of $25 million or more, it would have increased the cost to the federal taxpayer by between $1.6 billion and $2.6 billion. That's billions more that would be spent to carry out a project rather than having just pure open competition. Uh, we should be allowing uh, free and open competition on projects and not artificially increasing the cost to taxpayers uh, to carry out public projects. Uh, if you look uh, at the Wall Street Journal, they specifically addressed the executive order uh, that we're trying to prevent funds from being uh, spent to, to carry out. Wall Street Journal actually criticized the executive order uh, and called, called these handouts a raw, quote, raw display of political favoritism at the expense of an industry experiencing 27 percent unemployment and they also called this a, quote, rotten deal for taxpayers. We should be trying to save every dollar we can. We should be trying to promote fair and open competition. Uh, that's why the Associated Builders and Contractors support this amendment. And go further on, there was an investigation done uh, by the Washington Examiner uh, regarding a project labor agreement on a federal building here in Washington, D.C. That one project, one project because of the PLA requirement, the taxpayers ended up having to foot an additional $3.3 million for that one project, a building here in Washington, D.C. And just want to go on a little bit further regarding studies and the numbers of studies have been done regarding PLAs. Uh, but they show that it increases construction costs by 12 to 18 percent. So ultimately what we're saying is, look, if, if a PLA wins the day, wins the bid, that's, that's their prerogative. But you shouldn't be mandating these increased costs. You shouldn't be shutting out those open shop uh, companies. And by the way, the open shop companies represent about 87 percent of the U.S. construction workforce. Uh, so why would we be shutting out 87 percent of the people out there who want to compete for these, for these jobs, for these construction projects? And why should we be adding over a billion dollars to two billion dollars of increased cost to the American taxpayer? We can stop it. We can save that taxpayer money and do a much better job of stewarding for the American people and allow more people to go back to work in a fair and open way. Uh, so with that, I will yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Washington. Uh, I rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment and 
and uh, strike the requisite number of words. Gentleman, reserve his point of order or continue his point of order. Uh, I withdraw my point of order. Gentleman withdraws. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, I rise in strong opposition to the gentleman's amendment. Executive Order 13502 gives federal officials the option to determine if it is right for a particular construction project. There is no mandate. And if the gentleman has read the legislation, he'll recognize there's no mandate. I yield? I yield. The reason I used the term mandate is because the practical implementation of this, when you look at how the department's would, implementing it, they're requiring it. They're requiring PLAs. I think it's fairly clear that the gentleman knows that the executive order is only to promote efficiency in federal procurement. A project labor agreement is a pre-hire agreement that establishes the terms and conditions of employment for a specific construction project. There is, in the gentleman's part of this, a PLA mandate myth that has been floating around since the executive order was issued with, that the federal government mandates project labor agreements. Actual language from the executive order says, and I quote, this order does not require an executive agency to use a project labor agreement on any construction project. I'm sure the gentleman will be pleased to hear that. Let me explain what the executive order does do. It asks the federal agencies to submit a quarterly report identifying all contracts awarded for large-scale construction projects and whether or not a PLA was used on the project. Allows all contractors and subcontractors to compete for contracts and subcontracts. Contains guarantees against strikes, lockouts, and similar job disruptions, and provides binding procedures for resolving labor disputes that may arise during the terms of the project labor agreement provides mechanism for labor and management cooperation on matters of mutual interest and concern, such as productivity, quality of work, safety, and health, and includes any additional requirements that an agency deems necessary. Including this language would be a mistake, since this executive order ensures construction pro projects are built correctly the first time, on time, and as a result on a budget for the end user. In addition, this executive order prevents costly delays that usually result from an unskilled workforce's lack of knowledge regarding the use of building materials or tools as well as job uh, site safety measures. I urge all members to vote no on this uh, amendment. And uh, again, if the, gentleman, if, the, if the gentleman, I will yield to the gentleman if he if he wants to make a comment, since I mentioned him directly. No, and I, and I appreciate the uh, gentleman yielding because, as I said earlier, you know, the language, and in, in, you know, as you're correct in reading the language of the executive order, the problem we've had is that the White House political appointees are requiring PLAs. Well, no, and let me just say something. To the and gentleman. I'll yield back. I had an example in my own state, a very significant project. I urged a project labor agreement, and they turned me down. They said, this is not the kind of project that we do project labor agreements on it. I was impressed that they made a decision, uh, you know, and I, I, I didn't like the answer, but, it, but they said we have discretion to either do this or not do this, which is what I think we'd want them to do, because there are some situations where these agreements do add for stability between management and labor. If you have things like, the, I think, the cleanup site down at Hanford, has a, uh, in Doc Hastings District, has a project labor agreement. That has given, there was no strike so we could move forward and do this waste cleanup work that's so important. So I just say to the gentleman, uh, I hope that in the future he'll recognize that there is no legal requirement. And they're not requiring people to do it. And agencies are saying no when, when they think it's inappropriate. So I don't think the gentleman's amendment is necessary and I hope that it will be defeated. For what purpose the gentleman from Arizona rise? Move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I think the gentleman, uh, both gentlemen here speaking are right. This, this uh, requirement, the executive order, does not mandate the use uh, of PLAs. However, some agencies have taken it and interpreted it as such, that it w should mandate it. And let me give you one example here. On October 15, 2010, just a few months ago, uh, this is uh, the Army Corps of Engineers issued PIL 211-1 to 
to all Army Corps contracting offices providing implementing guidance for the use of PLAs on Army Corps construction contracts. The following are major PIL elements. Here it is. Requires the project delivery team, PDT, to, discover, or to consider the use of a PLA on a project by project basis by conducting a PLA labor market survey during acquisition planning. And so what this Did what the this gentleman does, say consider? No, Did I hear consider? Yes, but then you, it goes further. So there was a complaint because uh, some people didn't want that in. The complaint came back and the Army Corps came back and said that they should receive additional consideration if they do use a PLA. And that should be strictly forbidden. And so there, there, is, there is a problem here. We do have a problem with the agencies interpreting this in a way that would require the use of a PLA or give added weight to the use of a PLA. Now, when the gentleman says this amendment is not required because it's not prescriptive, the current law without the executive order is the same thing. They can, they can consider the use of a PLA. Nothing prohibits that now. So the executive order, all it's doing is giving some agencies reason to maybe mandate the use of a PLA. And that's why we're trying to strike the executive order. The scenario that the gentleman described, the gentleman from Washington describes, where nobody is requiring or mandate, mandating anything, that exists without the executive order. So that's what we're trying to do here is remove that executive order that gives added weight to PLAs. Now in Arizona, for example, some 90-some 90, 90 percent of workers there are not union workers. They, they, they don't want a PLA. And if you have a project that gives added weight to PLAs, that disenfranchises a lot of people in Arizona, more than 90 percent of the population. So we just can't do that. We shouldn't do that. And so the, the gentleman's amendment uh, should be accepted. We did a similar one. It was accepted in the Appropriations Committee with regard to uh, the MILCON budget, uh, the MILCON Appropriations Bill. And so that will come to the floor with this amendment already in it. I, I would suggest to the gentleman from uh, Washington and others who oppose this uh, that we're simply trying to get back to a time where PLAs can be considered, but they aren't construed as being necessary or mandated by the agency. Well, the gentleman yield. I will. The executive order requires all contractors and subcontractors to compete for contracts and subcontracts. And, the, and they also, the, the, the quid pro quo here for the government is they get a guarantee against strikes, lockouts, and similar job disruptions, and provides binding procedures for resolving labor disputes that may arise during the term of the PLA. So as long as they, they, there's no mandatory requirement, Sometimes a project labor agreement is a positive thing. It might be. And, and under, without the executive order, they can consider that. Nothing prohibits that. But the problem is, is the executive order has led to a situation where some agencies interpret that as requiring a PLA. And that's what we're trying to get away from. And so the, the, uh, the amendment is a good one. Uh, I would urge its adoption. I thank the gentleman for bringing it forward. This will be consistent with another appropriation bill that is coming to the floor with this already in, already having been accepted by the Appropriations Committee. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. No, one's, no one requests time on this amendment. The question then is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana. Those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say nay. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Gentlemen from Washington. Mr. Chairman, we ask for a recorded vote on that amendment. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Louisiana will be postponed. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentleman from New York raise? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Engel of New York. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used by the Department of Homeland Security to lease or purchase new light duty vehicles for any executive fleet or for any agency's fleet inventory, except in accordance with Presidential Memorandum Federal Fleet Performance dated May 24, 2011. Madam, uh, 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 Mr. Chair. Do you... 
I have a point of order. Reserve a point of order. I reserve a point of order. The gentleman from Alabama reserves a point of order. The gentleman from New York is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, last week, President Obama uh, issued a presidential memorandum on federal fleet performance, which would require all new light duty vehicles in the federal fleet to be alternate fuel vehicles, such as hybrid, electric, natural gas, or biofuel, by December 31st, 2015. My amendment echoes the presidential memorandum on federal fleet performance by, by prohibiting funds in the DHS appropriations bill from being used to lease or purchase new light duty vehicles except in accordance with the president's May 24th memorandum. Our transportation sector is by far the biggest reason we send $600 billion per year to hostile nations such as Venezuela and others to pay for oil at ever increasing costs. But America does not need to be dependent on foreign sources of oil for transportation fuel. Alternative technologies exist today that, when implemented broadly, will allow any alternative fuel to be used in America's automotive fleet. The federal government operates the largest fleet of light-duty vehicles in America. According to the GSA, there are 662,154 vehicles in the federal fleet, with 54,972 belonging to the Department of Homeland Security. By supporting a diverse array of vehicle technologies in our federal fleet, we'll encourage development of domestic energy resources, including biomass, natural gas, coal, agricultural waste, hydrogen, and renewable electricity. Expanding the role of these energy sources play in our transportation economy will help break the leverage over Americans held by foreign government-controlled oil companies, increasing our nation's domestic security and protecting consumers from price spikes and shortages in the world oil markets. Uh, I have been, been pushing uh, to use and have uh, in America uh, alternative fuels. Tomorrow I'm holding a press conference with Mr. Shimkus and Mr. Bartlett. Uh, the three of us are uh, supporting a bill, and this goes in line uh, with that. So I'd urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to support and accept my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, uh, Chairman, I, reserve, I uh, withdraw my point of order, and we accept the amendment. Gentleman withdraws his point of order Mr. Chairman. and accepts the amendment. Gentleman from Alabama. Yes, we accept the amendment. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I move to strike the last words. The gentleman from North Carolina is recognized. Uh, we too would like to accept the amendment and commend the gentleman from New York for uh, offering the amendment. He's um, bringing uh, federal practice into uh, line with uh, the presidential memorandum of, um, of, of a few uh, days ago. And this will promote the use of alternative fuel vehicles, hybrids, electrics, natural gas, biofuels by, by 2015. It will be a positive step to reduce uh, our dependence on foreign oil to uh, develop alternative energy sources and to make of the federal government and its fleet an example that uh, the rest of the country can look to. So we uh, urge adoption and yield back uh, the balance of my time. Seeing no other speakers on this issue, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New York. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. The opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. For what purpose does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, it, it would be the secure fence amendment. Clerk will re report the amendment. Two one two is a numerical. Yep. Two one two. We got it. Clerk will report it. Yeah. Amendment offered by Mr. King of Iowa. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section of the funds made available by this act under the heading Border Security Fencing Infrastructure and Technology. Fifty million dollars shall be for carrying out section 102 of the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996, 8 United States Code, 1103 note. Mr. Chairman. May, uh, Mr. 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 Chair. Does the gentleman from Alabama? I, I, I reserve a point of order on the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman from Alabama reserves a point of order. Mr. Chairman. 
For what purpose the gentleman from North Carolina raised? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have not seen this amendment. Okay, a copy will be distributed. And while that is happening, the gentleman from uh, Iowa is recognized for will almost be five minutes. For what purpose the gentleman from Washington rise? Two. Your point of order is reserved as well. The gentleman from Iowa has five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the amendment that I offer is an amendment that uh, directs that of the funds made available in the bill, there is a, there's a $150 million category, roughly, well, one third of it, or specifically, $50 million shall be used to carry out the Section 102 of the Illegal Immigration Immigrant Responsibility Act, which is the governing statute that directs that offense be built on our southern border. We've watched as the uh, as the Congress has directed that there be Secure Fence Act be passed, that the fence be built, and we've watched the administrations of the last two administrations be less than enthusiastic about their construction. We heard President Obama standing within about, uh, let's say, 220 yards of the Rio Grande River in El Paso a month or more ago, say that he believed that the fence was uh, basically complete, to quote the President. Well, basically complete, by his definition, would mean this that we have 14.3 miles only of 700 miles directed by this Congress, 14.3 miles only of, of tertiary fencing. That's three fences, which, as far as I know, that's the most effective way. We only have 36.3 miles of secondary or double fencing, Mr. Chairman. And if you want to really stretch this out and give them a lot of credit for building something, uh, they have about 350 miles of primary fencing. That's less than half of the minimum amount of secure fence, which takes, I believe, double fencing. Vehicle fencing, uh, 299 miles. They haven't done what was directed by Congress. This amendment goes out and, and it sets aside $50 million, which is only going to build about 25 more miles of good fencing, but it sends the right message and it keeps them from going off and spending the money, all of it, on the other categories that are made available within this bill. The bill is, uh, is fine with the money that's there, but the definition is too broad and it allows the administration to slide away. My, uh, my amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, directs that, that the $50 million be spent on the fence. And I think it's ironic that the President himself, uh, standing down in El Paso that five or so weeks ago when he gave the speech that said that the fence is basically complete, and he said what some people are going to want to moat, some people are going to want to moat with alligators in it, and ridiculed the uh, effectiveness of the fence. The irony, Mr. Chairman, is that 220 yards away is the Rio Grande River, and the canal, and if you count the fences at El Paso where they have given us the effectiveness of the secure fence that is built there, there's a fence, a Rio Grande River, another fence, a patrol road full of border patrol, another fence, a, a fast moving canal with concrete bottoms and sides, and another fence. So if you're going to get into the United States in El Paso, you've got to get over four fences and swim two moats to get there, and the president was making fun of it. 220 yards away. I think his staff served him poorly that day. They should have flown Air Force One over that. But we know that fences work, but they must be maintained. And yes, we need the technology on them. This directs that the resources be used, at least for the $50 million of the money made available, to build actual fence. And it references Section 102, which is the governing section. And by the way, before we argue this parliamentary, when I do have uh, another other language I'll be happy to offer if we're unsuccessful in the parliamentary argument that's bound to ensue. So I urge the adoption of my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Alabama. Yes, um, Mr. Chair, I, Mr. Chairman, I um, insist on uh, making a point of order. Will the gentleman state your point of order? I make a point of order against the amendment because it provides an appropriation for an unauthorized program and violates Clause 2 of uh, Rule 21. Clause 2 to Rule 21 states in pertinent part, an appropriation may not be in order as an amendment for an expenditure not previously authorized by law. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the amendment proposes to appropriate funds for a program that is not authorized. The amendment therefore violates Clause 2, Rule 21, and I ask for a ruling from the Chair. Does anyone wish to be heard on the point of order? Mr. Chairman. And from Iowa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd point out that I referenced specifically the authorized by law program, and that's Section 102 of the Illegal Immigration and Immigrant Responsibility Act of 1996. And according to the alleged counsel, Section 102 governs everything related to the border fence. 
So I took care to draft this amendment to, to directly address the objection that was raised by the gentleman from Alabama, whom I greatly respect. Um, this Reinforced Fencing Act is a Again, it goes directly to Section 102. It's an authorized section. It's governing. It's governing in the code, and that's the Council of Ledge Council. So, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I would uh, conclude my argument that this is drafted specifically to address the objection I've just heard, and I'm hopeful that I will receive a positive result from the chair. Thank you. And I yield back. Does anyone else wish to be heard on the point of order? Then the chair is prepared to rule. The amendment proposes to earmark certain funds in the bill. Under Clause 2A of Rule 21, such an earmarking must be specif spe specifically authorized by law. The burden of establishing the authorization in the law rests with the proponent of the amendment. Finding that this burden has not been carried, the point of order is sustained and the amendment is not in order. I'm not Who seeks recognition? If he's ready, I will. Okay. Mr. Gentleman Chairman. from Iowa. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, numerical number is 203, King Amendment 203. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. King of Iowa at the end of the bill before the short title insert the following. Section, none of the funds made available by this act may be used to carry out the provisions of Public Law 111-148 Public Law 111-152, or any amendment made by either of such laws. Gentleman from Washington. Gentleman from Washington reserves a point of order. The gentleman from Iowa is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment is an amendment that um, I think everybody's going to understand. It just clarifies that none of the funds made available in this bill shall be used to carry out the provisions of uh, what's commonly referred to as Obamacare. That's the two sections of public law that's referenced in the amendment that we heard the clerk just read. And uh, the argument will be made that this, um, this is unnecessary because the bill doesn't specifically go to uh, appropriations to, to the uh, Health Care Act that uh, carries the President's name. I would argue that we don't know. 2,600 plus pages and no one understands it and we're finding new regulations on a regular basis. Uh, a couple of things that might be uh, under, the, under the appropriations that we're discussing here is it's possible that DHS could be participating in exchanges for immigrant health uh, in health care or perhaps they could be auditing companies and helping to enforce the compliance with Obamacare. That's a couple of things that come to mind for me. I think this is very important. This Congress has uh, a number of times voted to repeal and to unfund Obamacare and for us to inadvertently allow the appropriations that could be utilized to carry out the provisions of it I think would be an omission, an unforgivable omission on part of this Congress. So I urge the adoption of this amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Washington. Mr. Chairman, I insist on my point of order. Gentleman will state your point of order. Mr. Chairman, uh, I make a point of order against the amendment because it violates, violates Clause 5A2 of Rule 21. The amendment prohibits the use of funds for implementing the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and is thus proposing a limitation on funds in a general, general appropriation bill for the administration of a tax or tariff in violation of the rule. Any member wish to be heard on this point of order? Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Iowa. Uh, the, um, the, the rule referenced by the gentleman, uh, we have uh, many, many, many limitations on funds in our appropriations bills. And um, if the decision comes down to and whether there is a parliamentary objection or not, I think I could go back through many of these appropriation bills and find limitation after limitation after limitation. The practice of this Congress has been to do so. And there will be other amendments that have not been objected to that limit the utilization of funds within this bill and every other. So I simply make that argument to the, uh, to the chair and yield back the balance of my time. Does anyone else wish to be heard on the point of order? If not, the chair is ready to rule. The gentleman from Washington makes a point of order against the amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa on the ground that it carries a tax measure on a bill reported by a committee, in this case the Committee on Appropriations, not having jurisdiction to report tax measures in violation of Clause 5A of Rule 21. 
Clause 5A of Rule 21, the phrase tax or tariff measure expressly includes an amendment proposing a limitation on funds in a general appropriation bill for the administration of a tax or tariff. The amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa is in the form of a limitation on the funds in the pending general appropriation bill. That is, it proposes a negative restriction on those funds for a specified purpose. The purpose specified in the amendment offered by the gentleman from Iowa is the execution of the law compromising, comprising the Affordable Care Act. The chair takes notice that the Affordable Care Act involves sundry provisions of federal tax law. The amendment therefore proposes to limit funds for the administration of a tax and as such it constitutes a violation of Clause 5A of Rule 21. The point of order is sustained. The amendment is not in order. Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Iowa. I have an amendment at the desk. It would be the last King Amendment, designated as the last King Amendment. <laughs> the clerk will report the last King Amendment. Do you got a number on the last King Amendment? 205. The clerk will report Amendment 205. Amendment offered by Mr. King of Iowa. At the end of the bill, before the short title, insert the following section. None of the funds made available by this act shall be made available to the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, Acorn Beneficial Association, Inc., Arkansas Broadcast Foundation, Inc., Acorn Children's Beneficial Association, Arkansas Community Housing Corporation. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent the amendment be considered as read. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Unanimous consent has been requested that it be considered read. Mr. Chairman. Is there objection to that? I object. We don't okay. have a copy of the amendment. The objection is held. Mr. Chairman. We continue to report. Point of order. From Washington, point of order. I, it, we cannot function if the majority is not going to give the minority uh, a copy of these amendments. And I would I think the, pr the, pre the process here should stop until we have a copy of the amendment. The, the clerk is reading the amendment after which it will we be distributed. We do not have a copy of it. After which it will be distributed. The clerk will continue. Acorn Children's Beneficial Association, Arkansas Community Housing Corporation, Acorn Community Land Association, Inc., Acorn Community Land Association of Illinois, Acorn Community Land Association of Louisiana, Acorn Community Land Association of Pennsylvania, Acorn Community Labor Organizing Center, Acorn Beverly LLC, Acorn Canada, Acorn Center for Housing, Acorn Housing Affordable Loans, LLC, Acorn Housing One Associates, LP, Acorn Housing Two Associates, LP, Acorn Housing Three Associates, LP, Acorn Housing Four Associates, LP, Acorn International, Acorn Votes, Acorn 2004 Housing Development Fund Corporation, ACRMW, ACSI, Acorn Cultural Trust Incorporation, Incorporated, American Environmental Justice Project, Inc., Acorn Fund, Inc., Acorn Fa Fair Housing Organization, Inc., Acorn Foster Parents, Inc., AGAP Broadcast Foundation, Inc., Acorn Housing Corporation, Arkansas Acorn Housing Corporation, Acorn Corp Housing Corporation of Arizona, Acorn Housing Corporation of Illinois, Acorn Housing Corporation of Missouri, New Jersey, Acorn Housing Corporation, Inc., AHCNY, Acorn Housing Corporation of Pennsylvania, Texas Acorn Housing Corporation, Inc., American Institute for Social Justice. Clerk, clerk will suspend. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Unanimous consent is asked that it be considered having been read. No, I, I object, Mr. Chairman. Uh, objection still obtained. The clerk will continue reporting. Acorn Law for Education, Rep and Training, Acorn Law Reform Pack, Affiliated Media Foundation Movement, Albuquerque Minimum Wage Committee, Acorn National Broadcasting Network, Arkansas New Party, Arkansas Acorn Political Action Committee, Association for Rights of Citizens, Acorn Services, Inc., Acorn Television and Action for Communities, Acorn Tenants Union, Inc., Acorn Tenant Union Training and Organization Project, AWA, Baltimore Organizing Support Center, Inc., Bronx Parent Leadership, Baton Rouge Acorn Education Project, Inc., 
Baton Rouge Association of School Employees, Broad Street Corporation, California Acorn Political Action Committee, Citizens Action Research Project, Council Beneficial Association, Citizens Campaign for Fair Work, Living Wage, etc., Citizens Consulting Inc., California Community Network, Citizens for April Troop, Clean Government PAC, Chicago Organizing and Support Center Inc., Council Health Plan, Citizen Services Society, Campaign for Justice at Avondale, CLOC, Community and Labor for Baltimore, Chief Organizer Fund, Colorado Organizing and Support Center, Community Real Estate Processing Inc., Campaign to Reward, reward Work, Citizen Services Incorporated, Elysian Fields Corporation, Environmental Justice Training Project Inc., Franklin Acorn Housing Corporation, Flagstaff Broadcast Foundation, Floridians for All PAC, 15th Street Corporation, Friends of Wendy Boy, Greenwell Springs Corporations, Genevieve Stewart Campaign Fund, Hammurabi Fund, Houston Organizing Support Center, Hospitality Hotel and Restaurant Org Council, Iowa Acorn Broadcasting Corp, Illinois Home Day Care Workers Association, Inc., Illinois Acorn Political Action Committee, Illinois New Party, Illinois New Party Political Committee, Institute for Worker Education, Inc., Jefferson Association of Parish Employees, Jefferson Association of School Employees, Johnny Pugh Campaign Fund, Louisiana Acorn, New York Communities for Change, Affordable Housing Centers of America, Action Now, Pennsylvania Communities Organizing for Change, Arkansas Community Organizations, the Alliance for Califor of Californians for Community Empowerment, New England United for Justice, Texas Organizing Project, Minnesota, Neighborhoods Organizing for Change, Organization United for Reform, Missourians Organizing for Reform and Empowerment, a Community Voice, Community Organizations International, Applied Research Center, or the Working Families Party. Gentleman from Iowa is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the amendment that um, prohibits any of the funds made available on this act to um, go to these associations that are in the list of this amendment. We'd like to have been able to just simply define ACORN and their affiliates, but because the definition of affiliates uh, created some problems, we had to go with the actual list of the affiliates that uh, has been compiled in a large part by the Government Oversight Committee and in another part by the contributions of the astute media that's done some research on this. This is similar to the uh, language, or excuse me, similar to the effect of the language that we passed in previous Congresses under the um, Democrat majority. We've seen what ACORN has done and attempted to do to undermine the legitimate election process in the United States. And uh, the things that we saw with the video and the film that were going on inside the offices of ACORN, I believe, and there's under oath testimony before this Congress of, uh, of uh, at least one ACORN, former ACORN employee, employee who testified that she believed that what we saw in the film that became forward on YouTube uh, and was uh, and posted in other media outlets actually reflected the culture inside the ACORN offices and reflecting of their offices around the country. And we saw that in five or six offices around the country. For this Congress, uh, we must not forget that our Constitution's foundation is set upon legitimate elections and uh, to subsidize the people that are in the business of undermining it would be the wrong thing to do. This amendment uh, shuts off the funding to the or organizations that have a record of doing so. Uh, ACORN and their affiliates, it's a list of over 300, and I'd just say over 300 sprouts from one large oak tree grew. These are the associates, the successors, uh, and the affiliates of the larger and now uh, some disbanded organization known as ACORN. So I urge the adoption of my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose the gentleman from New North Carolina rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment and move to strike the last words. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is an extraordinary amendment, a listing of uh, over three pages of, of organizations by name singled out on the floor of the House of Representatives for um, 
Um, this kind of, this kind of uh, negative treatment, this kind of uh, legislation that would simply render them ineligible for any kind of activity under this legislation, under this uh, appropriations bill. Now, I uh, seriously doubt that there's money in the uh, Homeland Security bill that would go to any of these organizations, but um, still the principle is very troubling. I, so I want to ask the, the gentleman, the offer of the amendment, just about a few of these organizations and ask him to document the, whatever information he has about this specific organization that would justify their being included on this kind of list, being singled out in this way. What does the gentleman have, uh, what kind of information does the gentleman have on the Arkansas Community Housing Corporation? Well, gentleman gentleman yield? Yield? Yes, I'll be glad to yield. And, and I would tell you that, as, as I said in my opening remarks, this list has been in a large part compiled by the Government Oversight Committee. Does, does the gentleman have documentation as to what kind of uh, problems he's alleging with the Arkansas Community Housing Corporation that would warrant their inclusion on a list of this sort? I'm confident that I can produce that information for you. I do not Don't have it you here think with you me should tonight, produce it before you ask members the, to vote uh, on. I reference the Government Oversight Committee as the source for most of these lists. Can, can you produce that information tonight before you ask us to vote on this amendment? I'm sure that that's going to come up a little sooner and I'd be able to leave this floor and do that. So the answer to that is logistically no, but I can produce that information for you. What about the American Environmental Justice Project? Does the gentleman have information on that or would fit in the same category? Well, you're asking your colleagues here tonight, before the entire nation, to stigmatize these organizations, to say these organizations, you, you have information you're claiming mm -hmm. about these organizations that would warrant this kind of, uh, of treatment, this kind of uh, blackballing of these organizations with respect to any ability to compete legitimately for governmental funds. Don't, don't you think you should have brought with you to the floor documentation of the of the problems with these organizations that would warrant this kind of treatment let me let me ask you about uh, the, would yield. the agape the agape broadcast foundation what kind of information do you have about uh, the agape foundation um, if the gentleman would yield I, I won't be speaking directly to that foundation but I'll again reiterate but you are singling out that foundation you are if, singling if out that foundation yielded, I, I will say that I don't recall this objection when the, when the large majority of this House, under the Democrat majority, voted to cut off the funds to ACORN and their affiliates. And so that principle applies yet today, in my view. How about the Affiliated Media Foundation movement? Does the gentleman have, uh, have, have documentation of why that, uh, that organization should be included uh, here tonight? If the gentleman would yield, I would uh, submit that we could reiterate the same question over 300 times over this amendment. And I'll tell you the source of this information is primarily the Government Oversight Committee. The minutes of that committee and their record is there and it's available and there will be resources that go in below into the depth of the committee report. At and, best, but some uh, of this also comes from media reports. So I want to make sure that my time. At that. best, this would appear to be some kind of guilt, uh, guilt by association, but I, I'm not sure it even rises to that level. Do we, do we know about the associations of these, these organizations that would warrant their being tarred uh, by this uh, treatment uh, here tonight? Would, wouldn't the gentleman uh, uh, have the respect for his colleagues to bring to the floor, to bring to the floor the documentation that leads him to smear these organizations and include them on this uh, extraordinary amendment. You're, you're expecting us to vote on this. What about the uh, affiliated media foundation movement? Does the gentleman have information about that organization? As I said to the gentleman, we could go through this through over 300 times and you could ask the same question over 300 times and it's substantially the same answer. This primary component of this list came from the Government Oversight Committee. We can go get the records from the committee and we could produce those, but I don't think this Congress is interested in holding up this process while I go and, and, and contact the chairman and the staff to pull that information. Well, the gentleman has been planning to offer this amendment. Why didn't you have the basic respect for this body to gather this documentation, knowing that these questions would be raised by anyone who wants conscientiously to, uh, to, to, to vote on this amendment? Uh, the gentleman would yield. Um, doesn't the converse of that also apply, that, that there's an implication of disrespect for the Government Oversight Committee and the legitimacy of their findings? Well, I... The gentleman's time has expired. 
I uh, urge. Uh, Thank you. The gentleman from Washington. I rise in opposition to the amendment. Strike the, number strike of the requisite number of Gentlemen words. Gentlemen recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> I, wanna, I, I just think that this is, uh, I hope that the chairman will object to this amendment uh, and ask the gentleman to withdraw it. I think this is an extraordinary uh, attack on all of these groups. But we have no evidence, we have no information whatsoever to base a decision on here. I mean, you can say that the, gov the government oversight didn't write you a letter and ask you to offer this amendment, did they? You have no official relationship with the government oversight committee, do you? I'm not on the committee, if that's the gentleman's question. Well, I mean, so, so who went and put this list together? The does government the gentleman, oversight does committee, the gentleman if the gentleman would yield. I yield. Issues? Of course I yield. Okay. We ask, ask everyone to speak to the Thank chair. You. The gentleman is breaking. Thank you.